Hey everybody, it's Joe from Gadgetry Tech, and today we're going to be reviewing the Astro A50X. Marks the spot where my wallet died, <laughs> because this is $380. I did purchase this with my own money. It was not sent to me for review by Logitech or Astro. In fact, I emailed them numerous times prior to this uh, product coming out, asking for any kind of information, because there were leaks. And all of my emails to both the third-party PR team and Logitech were completely ignored until other channels already released their coverage. Um, and, um, you know, like websites release their press info. I got zero support from them, so it's a bummer, but my channel's smaller, so it is what it is. I'm not going to use that to have like a sour taste and bash the product for no reason. There are things I really like about the A50X and things that I don't, or at least want to call out from my own, you know, personal experience because I want to run a very unbiased, uh, honest and open channel. So, um, no worries, no harm, no foul there. Now, $380 is a lot of money. It's actually not the most expensive gaming headset I've ever covered. I've actually covered um, the A Zone A Rise, which is $750. And I haven't covered this before, but Odyssey has the LCD GX, which is a gaming headset for about $900. That's analog only, just has a cable. So this uh, is not the least expensive one or the most expensive one out there, but it's certainly up there in price. Now, this has a lot of unique features. And for those of you who are looking for those features, it's going to be a good value. And for those who aren't, well, maybe you're not interested in paying for all the stuff that you may not be using. Um, so this video is going to be very long. I will have chapters below. So take a look at that. If you only care for one particular part, there will be some crossover uh, bits of information throughout as I think of it. Um, but I'm going to try to keep this structured. So let's get into the basics and discuss what you get in the box and how it works. So the A50X, it's the only version of the new generation A50, technically the Gen 5, um, but with the rebranding with Logitech, because Logitech owns Astro, um, maybe they're getting away with some of the uh, more conventional naming stuff. Plus, I think A50X, just um, it's simpler than saying Generation 5. So compared to the older ones, there are some similarities. It looks and is shaped identically. In fact, they use the exact same chassis for the headset and the base station, they just changed the parts inside. Now, this version, the A50X, works on all console platforms. It works on Xbox, it works on P PlayStation 5, and PC. Now, they said it won't work on um, Nintendo Switch, and that's just because the USB connection doesn't work on Nintendo Switch. However, because this has HDMI audio extraction, you can still plug a Nintendo Switch into this if it's docked. So the HDMI cable that was going to your TV can go into this, then you use a second HDMI cable, and you can wirelessly play audio on your Switch, um, you know, while you're connected to the TV. If my voice breaks or I sound out of breath, I've been sick for like a month, and this is finally like me recovering enough to film again. So apologies in advance. If you're new to the channel, I normally don't sound quite this nasally. <laughs> so as far as what's in the box, now there are some adapters in here. So this little wall plug is for the base. It has external power. And it has a removable piece. So you can see that you can have like the, the US spec version. And it comes with several adapters in the box for Asia, uh, Europe, and different receptacles. So the output, though, I want to talk about the voltage real quick because this is a detachable USB-C cable. However, this is 5.15 volts at 2 amps. Now, I didn't even bother trying a 5 volt 2 amp instead of 5.15. But from an audio sense, um, I'd imagine it's 5.15 for a reason. Maybe they're accounting for voltage loss in the cable, no idea. Um, but this cable is a combo cable, and I think they had to do this because they can only fit so much behind the dock. So you have this red cable plugged into here. Now this headset works as a PC headset without any other cables needed. Plug this into an AC outlet and plug this into your computer, and you can use this as a wireless gaming headset. All the other stuff is optional and it has to do with the console support. Now, there'll be a couple of frustrations and, and comments on this. And I want to say rightly so. I just, um, you know, Astro's response is if they included more cables, it would cost more. But it's already 380 bucks, And so it's already costing more. It comes with a USB A to C cable. It only comes with one of them. So that was kind of a bummer because if it's designed to work for Xbox and PlayStation, you also have to buy another USB A to C cable of whatever length you need. You also have to purchase an extra HDMI cable because this comes with zero HDMI cables in the box, even though it's an HDMI hub. 
Now, chances are, if you have an Xbox and a PlayStation 5 and you're connected to a television, you already have HDMI cables. In fact, both of those consoles come with them and they are HDMI 2.1 capable and certified. So you really only need one extra HDMI cable and one USB A to C cable if you want this all to work as advertised. I think they should have and could have included it for this price. That's my personal opinion. Um, but I did swap out the cables myself. Um, I'm using longer 10 foot cables. They're actually pretty cheap and they did work. We're gonna get into the HDMI compatibility after. But once all this is set up, you have a lot of cables coming out. You have a USB C to A cable going to your PlayStation, your Xbox, then the combo one to your PC, HDMI to each console, and then HDMI out to your television or monitor. Now this is unique and it's also a huge reason why this costs so much more because an HDMI 2.1 switching device is not cheap. And if you've looked at them online, they're usually like 80 to 120 bucks. So the old Astro 850 was 300 retail and now they added an HDMI switching mechanism. So that kind of explains the price increase, but was it necessary? So on Xbox and PC, it really wasn't because there's not a huge difference in sound quality if you're just using the USB A to C cable. However, there is a huge advantage of this on PlayStation, and that is game to chat mix is finally back on PlayStation 5. Sony is a pain when it comes to supporting third party or other products. They want you to buy their stuff. And historically, you know, they only allow game to chat mix being controlled from the headset if you bought the Sony PlayStation Pulse headset or the InZone H5, H7, or H9 gaming headsets, which for the money are pretty poor headsets. So because of that, and with that being said, the A50X is the best sounding and performing gaming headset for PlayStation 5 that has game to chat mix built into the headset. It has an excellent mic, which we'll get into, the sound quality we'll get into, but having native game to chat mix on the headset is huge. That alone might be enough justification for PlayStation buyers to purchase this because now you have this really convenient game to chat button on the side and then the volume rocker, of course. So that's a huge feature. Now Xbox works in a similar way. It's using HDMI to extract the game audio from the Xbox and then USB for your chat uh, support and the microphone being connected to the console. So when it gets detected as a headset, that's the cable. Now, if you don't use HDMI, you can bypass it all together on Xbox, still use just the USB-C cable, and still get game to chat mix. It works like a normal wireless headset does on Xbox. All the other companies don't use HDMI, and they have game to chat mix on Xbox, so it's the same way there. So it's not required on the Xbox side, and it's not required on the PlayStation side, but when you enable this headset, it disables the audio pass-through on the output side. So if you are trying to listen to this on your TV or a game capture device, you cannot do that while using the headset. So if you're planning on capturing game footage from your PlayStation 5 or Xbox because you're live streaming it on a PC, um, which is a fairly common thing, a lot of people have done that, you can't use this as an HDMI box anymore. You have to uh, basically stick with USB on all consoles and then bypass the HDMI altogether in order to stream. Same thing goes for multi-channel surround sound. There are certain things you have to disable to get this to work. Um, luckily you can bypass it, but then again, you're paying for basically a huge uh, part of the product that you're not gonna be using. Now, as far as build quality and comfort goes, they fixed something that was a huge problem for me on the Gen 4. The headband no longer pops out. Now this is my third Gen 4. This one's been zip tied. You can see the little straps I put on the top of the headband. Every time I put this headset on, and I bought three of these like over a span of three months, they all popped out the second I put it on because when you open this, it makes the headband kind of bend open. You can see it wanting to, and it would pop out. So pretty bad design choice, and I was surprised they honestly stuck with the same one on the new one. However, I've stressed this like crazy. You can see this thing really being held together in the middle now. And when I put it on my head, even if I pull down, it doesn't pop out. So for mine, it's been fixed. I like that a lot. Now, sharing a lot of the stuff of the older Gen 4, it's honestly essentially the exact same headset design. They didn't really change anything. They kind of rebranded it because you used to have Astro on the side of the cups, and now it says the G for Logitech. Microphone's been upgraded even though it looks the same. We'll get into the microphone performance. 
Everything feels the same though. The microphone mute mechanism, the cord thickness, the telescoping yoke. They changed the paint job a little bit. It has this, you know, still rubberized coating on it. But I like the design. I never disliked the old A50 for how it looked. And I certainly didn't dislike it for how it felt. I love the comfort. It has a good balance of being really secure uh, when it comes to clamp force. It's not as strong as the Turtle Beach um, Stealth Pro. Um, it's actually on the, for higher end gaming headsets tend to have a stronger clamp force. It's not on the heavier side, it's a little bit lighter. And if you look at the weight of this with the stock pads, mine scale is at uh, 364 grams. You compare it to the old Logitech one, let's just put it on again for comparison in case you own it, 372. So they made it slightly lighter. Now this uses a different driver technology. It's still a 40 millimeter driver, but it's uh, a graphene driver, whereas the old one it was a more traditional paper comb and or plastic, I should say. Now they use a graphene driver in the Logitech G Pro X2, the new one, but the G Pro X2 uses a 50 millimeter driver. We'll get into how that sounds after. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but now that we waited, I want to talk about a couple other things that were kind of surprising to me because this didn't make as much sense. Now you can see the pads. I like the Astro pads because they're very breathable, but if you look at the old pad, they shrunk them. They actually made the opening for your ear smaller on the new one. This did lead to a little bit more discomfort for me because I feel more pressure around my ear. I don't know why they changed it. Um, the pad fill seems to be a little bit more firmer uh, or I guess more plush. So maybe they did it for pad durability. But when you look at the width, so I'm just going to open this up here just to get the right uh, dimension until it touches. And I'm about 40 millimeters of width. Now I go to the new pad before it touches and pull that up. 35.6. I lost 5 millimeters, 35.45. I lost 5 millimeters of width on the pad. The height is almost the same, but it was uh, interesting that they made it more narrow. Now, thankfully, this is another uh, interesting thing. The Astro A50 Gen 4 pad, they use the exact same mount mechanism. So you can always put the older pads on it and get the larger opening, which means you can also use Wicked Cushion pads. Now I'm not, um, I don't like to push or suggest um, a product to buy no matter what, because there are some big benefits to the stock pad. However, one big advantage to the Wicked Cushion pad is the size. It's deeper, it's wider and taller, and for some people that can make a big difference for comfort has a sport fabric uh, leather right inside. It does have a big difference on sound quality, so I'll talk about that in the EQ section. But at least with the A50X, you have several options. All the pads that are compatible with the A50 Gen 4 will work uh, on the new A50X. So to me, that's a big win. But we're gonna go back to the stock pad for now just to kind of keep everything the same. Now, if you do consider buying a Wicked Cushion pad, I will have links in the description below to save you 15%. So consider that if you wanna save some money, otherwise uh, purchase it wherever and however you like. Now you can look here on the side, I'm using the A50 Gen 4 a lot because some people own that and they're just been waiting for the new one to come out. So I wanna show you something. It is the exact same design. Like they didn't reposition or change anything, they just changed the labels and the function of the button. So you still have the switch to turn the headset on, even lights up the same way. The button that used to be for Dolby, which was kind of useless when they got rid of optical, um, is now the play sync button. The placing button is what tells the dock what input to switch to if you want to toggle through both the USB and the HDMI connections, and the dock will tell you which connection you're on. Then you have Bluetooth now, thank God. So they got rid of the button to change EQ presets, which we'll get into, but this has Bluetooth. Now the Bluetooth is built into the base station, not the headset. So if the base station is connected to your console and you're wearing this, listening to something on your phone or talking to your buddy on Discord, whatever it is, and you want to leave the room, you can only go so far as what the Bluetooth connection to your base station allows it, and then the base station relays that back to the headset. So on that note with the whole toilet test thing, I like to talk about how far the wireless range goes. Um, it's not the best. I get about 30 feet before I'm getting a lot more cutouts compared to other headsets in this price range like the Maxwell and the Stealth Pro, they get like 55 to 70 feet through a couple walls before I get audio cutouts. So this range is shorter. It's interesting that they put everything in the uh, base station itself, 
but uh, nevertheless, that's how it functions. Now, the rest of the comfort goes, I still love the way these are designed for wearing it around your shoulders. It is so comfortable, probably the best of all the premium gaming headsets out there for uh, wearing around your neck. Doesn't squeeze you at all. And again, between the softer pad material, which does get warm, it's kind of like wearing a beanie or earmuffs, uh, but it doesn't get sweaty. I still like the pads. I could wear these for a long time. The only issue I've had, like I said, is the pad opening is smaller and I feel it pressing on the back of my ear more than I used to with the other uh, Gen 4. All right, now it's time to talk about HDMI and audio performance. You know, all the advanced connectivity that this has, there's a lot of configuration involved. So I wanna talk about the basic setup because as you can tell, this can get ridiculous very quickly. You have three HDMI cables going into it, three USB-C cables, and one of those is a combo that has a separate plug for power. They filled up the back. Now, they got rid of the uh, 3.5 millimeter stream port, so for those of you using an interface that used to tie in your mic feedback into the base, it can't do that anymore. Now, I think that's because they decided to not change any of the external components from the old one. They carried over the exact same design and they just physically, as you can tell, could not fit anything else in it. So they had to remove it. I think maybe if they made a dock slightly bigger, they could have still added it because I think that was a cool feature a lot of people liked. Nova Pro Wireless still has a 3.5 millimeter input. Uh, and believe it or not, the Logitech G Pro X2 wireless on the wireless transmitter has an aux in for a stream capture. It's a pretty unique uh, feature that not a lot of people know about. But the A50X, it's a lot of cables. And as I said, it didn't come with the extra HDMI, uh, but you don't have to use them either. You can use it as USB only, which is very important to know for the streaming side. As far as my configuration goes on Xbox, I tested this on two different OLED TVs and uh, a 4K 144 hertz gaming monitor. So I use the LG C2 and the Sony A90K OLEDs. And then for my gaming monitor, I tested this on was the Sony InZone M9, which hilariously is known to have some pretty poor uh, HDMI and DisplayPort compatibility, but this worked fine on that. Now I am able to run 4K 120. ALAM worked, which is automatic low latency mode, um, essentially. ALLM, sorry. And then uh, VRR, so the variable refresh rate worked fine. I was able to use HDR, no problem at all. And then on the Dolby pass through side, if you don't want the headset to work, it does pass through Dolby Atmos audio for surround sound. Now with the Xbox, I did have some uh, HDMI issues and I thought I solved it because you're, they the guide from Astro says to use 10-bit uh, video output among other settings. But when I switched it to 8-bit 8 8-bit 8 uh, output, my flickering stopped. Basically, if I was on the dashboard of Xbox, I was getting constant black screens and no matter what I did at the time, it just persisted. Now I didn't want to give up 4K 120 if I dropped it down to 60 hertz, they would fix the issue. So it was just not maintaining a stable handshake or signal uh, when I enabled all that. So I thought that fixed the problem, but then like a day or two later, I kept black screening again, and I had to power cycle everything to get it to work. More time goes by and it was working. And then on the um, uh, Sony OLED, the A90 um, with Xbox, I was having the same issue. All the stuff I was just talking about was on the LG C2. Um, I didn't really have any problems on my Sony monitor. It pretty much always worked fine, which was nice. But the OLED TVs, they were um, being a little problematic. Now, as far as your audio output settings go on Xbox, if you're connecting with HDMI, you're going to your audio settings, and then you set your headset format to Dolby Atmos for headphones. Now, even though, and when you do this, you can't modify the HDMI output. Thankfully, in this case, Xbox changes the, heads, the HDMI output to uh, the headset format. So it follows the same Dolby Atmos um, output that's designed for USB. This is hugely important, and this is why I think it sounds better on Xbox, because it's using the Dolby Atmos HRTF, or Head Related Transfer Function, for Xbox through HDMI, which means you get no uh, spatial audio loss as far as processing all that object oriented sound. Now once you've done that, if you go into the Dolby Atmos app on Xbox, you can set your settings however you like. However, what I recommend is setting it to the game mode at the top, disable performance mode, and don't use any intelligent equalizer. Set that to off, game mode on, but performance mode off, 
works the best for me. If you enable performance mode, it's designed for FPS and competitive play, but it modifies the way the spatial sound works, and sometimes it could sound too thin or uh, too surround-like, uh, making it harder to localize things. So you can experiment with it how you want, but I would not use Dolby Atmos for EQ because we can use some uh, more advanced EQ with this, which I'll get into. But once you've set the video output, basically everything to auto and just hope that it works. If not, you have to bypass HDMI on Xbox because I had repeatable issues, um, again, throughout my entire review process. I've had this for about a week and a half and the issues persisted, maybe a week. I don't know, it's kind of a blur now. Um, but anyway, so if you have issues with HDMI, just bypass it and stick with the, those audio settings. Otherwise, all of the automatic stuff works when it wants to work. I was able to preserve and keep everything on. Now on the PlayStation side, the uh, video setup was really easy. Everything worked on automatic. I didn't have to do the whole HDMI minus one or minus two for your profile. And then everything was working with 4K 120. I was able to use VRR, HDR, automatic low latency mode. All of that was on. HDR I actually set to always on and that helped with the transition speeds going in and out of games that are HDR. So it made the transition more seamless. So the video side, piece of cake on PlayStation. And again, I didn't have any uh, dropout issues. Now the audio settings of PS5 is way more tricky. And we're going to kick off a whole discussion about um, spatial audio in a moment. But there are different ways you can use this. So on PS5, you can use it as USB-C only, a USB connection, which allows you to use Tempest 3D audio. Now some people have been saying that uh, Astro or Logitech made the 850X more for Xbox and Windows and PS5 was an afterthought, which I don't think is a fair statement because the limitations have nothing to do with the A50X. It has everything to do with how Sony is allowing headsets to work on its platform. When you switch to HDMI audio out, it disables Sony's Tempest 3D audio for headphones. That's just a byproduct of how the PlayStation works. So you have to pick. Do you want 24-bit, 48 kilohertz sound from HDMI, which is more clear, it's noticeably more resolving, and I think the detail's better. Um, or do you want Tempest 3D audio, in which case you're stuck at 16-bit and using uh, USB-C only? So there's a give and take there on what you want. Now, if you use it for HDMI audio, you can set it to uh, basically TV output, which then allows you to do TV 3D sound. It's not the same as Tempest 3D audio. It sounds much worse. And for my personal preference, I highly suggest staying away from that. So I would just use HDMI audio with all the 3D stuff off. Or if you enable it, you can do the HDMI device type. And instead of TV or soundbar, you can select AV amplifier. And when you do that, it allows you to pick two channel 5.1 or 7.1. I picked 7.1 and I left the output as linear PCM, which is all the way down at the bottom. Doing this sounded louder and it was very, very clear and easy to pinpoint audio uh, sources in the game. That was my favorite setup for PlayStation. When I toggled back to USB, even with Tempest 3D audio, it sounded worse than using it with 24-bit HDMI set to AV amplifier 7.1 channel. Give that a shot. I'm not saying everyone's gonna love it, but to me that was the best benefit for PlayStation. And because you're doing this, when you use HDMI audio for the television, oh, by the way, disable switch automatically because it breaks it every time you boot up. Once the headset detects, it bypasses HDMI. Disable that and it'll always stay with the setting you pick. But once you've done all this, you have great sound quality, then you get game to chat mix because you're leveraging HDMI. On PS5, that's just so awesome. And to me, that's the best way to get the sound out of your console. Now for you surround sound people out there, if you happen to have this connected to an AV receiver, I te tested this on a Denon uh, 4700H, which is a good receiver. It has Dolby Atmos, DTSMA, all that stuff. And when you enable the HDMI configuration on PlayStation, for example, to output or even on Xbox to output for your headset, you're disabling Dolby Atmos pass-through, you're disabling Dolby Digital and DTS. None of that works on the headset, the headset would just be silent. So you have to downgrade the audio output through HDMI. Because of that, when you turn the headset off and it bypasses this dock to send it back out to your receiver, your receiver is now stuck with that limited and constrained audio output. You're not getting all of the surround sound pass through. So 
you can turn it back on, enable Atmos or DTS, and then your receiver will receive and decode the Dolby surround sound format, for example. And this dock does not prevent your receiver from working the way it's supposed to. The only limitation is that you have to go into the console settings every time you toggle between the receiver surround sound, like real surround sound output if you have height speakers and rear speakers versus stereo output for your headset. So it's cumbersome, but at least the dock does pass it through. Now, just a touch on the whole spatial audio and HRTF thing I was talking about earlier. That stands for head related transfer function. Now, Dolby Atmos and Tempest 3D Audio are both object-based audio solutions. It's essentially, instead of the uh, audio designer or game designer panning left and right to simulate a stereo effect, Atmos, for example, or Tempest, lets them pinpoint virtual objects. Think of it as like a whole cloud of dots around your head. And the audio engineer can pick this dot versus this dot or this dot. And the HRTF is what translates all of those audio objects into an output to your device. Sony's translation is slightly different than Dolby Atmos. That's why if you play the same game, they have a slightly different sound quality to them when you're comparing from PlayStation to Xbox. So bypassing the HRTF on Sony is why some people think it sounds better or worse, because it just depends on how you interpret that output or that translation. They play around with amplitude, which is how loud or quiet things are, they play around with phase, which means if the speakers are going in and out, maybe it offsets the phase, it creates a little bit of a delay. And all of these things affect how sound waves interact with your head and how you perceive the location of objects. So there is no one right setting for every single person. You're gonna have your own preference based on how those HRTFs translate in your head, how your ears and brain hear it. So just on a quick subject, that's how that works. So now it's time to talk about sound quality, and this is going to be another area of contention because uh, people have their own preference on what they think sounds good or not. And Astro and Logitech lately have their own tuning philosophy that differs a bit to what other companies are doing, and as a result, that profile may or may not agree with you. So I'm going to start with the general bass performance. The bass is strong on this for two parts. One, it's tuned to have slightly emphasized bass, but not overly so but it's a darker sounding headset, meaning the treble isn't so strong. So when you have neutral or emphasized bass with darker treble, it sounds like the sound is tilted to heavily favor bass. Um, the bass is a bit thick sounding. However, it's very well textured. Like when I say textured, some headsets are like one hit wonders. The bass is there or it isn't. This one has a very clear uh, delivery of deep bass versus mid bass a fast punch when you want it, that really textured rumble if there's like an explosion off in the distance. Frankly, it's surprising. Um, it's one of the best bass deliveries I've heard on a gaming headset. The throne still belongs to the Odyssey Maxwell, but I am really impressed with the bass delivery on the A50X. A lot of people are gonna love it. Now, it's countered by the mid-range being very neutral. It's actually a fairly it's, it follows a Harman curve extremely well, and as a result, voices sound natural. They don't sound like someone is up an octave, you know, like their voice got thinner. They also don't sound like they're deeper or stepped in mud and it's all over their throat. I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> Basically, their, their voices aren't sounding modified. It's true to the source, which is also known as timbre, which does affect musical instruments as well. So where the drawback to me is, when you go from 3000 hertz to 6000 hertz, this is recessed. And it makes the headset sound less detailed, less resolving, and darker than some other headsets that frankly have a lot more energy in the treble region. So if you like things to sound more energetic and treble forward, out of the box, this is not the headset for you. However, if anything with strong treble is offensive to you or you're very sensitive to those frequencies, out of the box, this is very easy to listen to. To cut to the chase, out of the box without any EQ settings, uh, it's not worth $380 to me. It's not a $380 sounding headset, especially when you have the Odyssey Maxwell for 300 to 330, that just sounds insane compared to this out of the box. Much more detail retrieval. You're granted you're paying for different features here. It's not purely on sound, but don't expect this to be the best sounding one just because of the price. So it takes the EQ well. I'm going to talk about EQ, but I want to finish talking about like the subjective stuff. 
Um, I think the soundstage is dark and out of the box. I don't think there's a lot of instrument separation or good layering of details. This is compounded by the fact that if you use the simultaneous Bluetooth, it becomes kind of a mess with audio and it's a little hard to pick up or pinpoint footsteps, for example, or audio cues in game that give you good spatial awareness. This is again how it sounds without EQ because I drastically changed it and to me it makes a, a monumental difference. So um, there's another thing to talk about actually and this is has to do with it being a closed back, meaning the sound is not designed to leak. Everything is sealed behind it. On a closed back, you have to deal with reflections. It's the same thing as like when I talk, if I cuff my hands around my mouth, my voice is reflecting off this. It's kind of like why you do that at a wall. It sounds different than just talking naturally. And to combat that, you can change the internal uh, driver design, you know, behind the driver, like the, the baffle, um, both in front and then the casing behind it, like the enclosure in the ear cup. And when you do that, you can tamper uh, the reflections. Some people put padding inside or little boxes or diffusers to alter the reflections, which does change the sound. If I take the pad off, you can see there's a thick fleece, like acoustic fleece here. This has uh, a reduction of treble as a result. It sounds smoother. Now, I think they did a lot of this treatment to adhere closer to the Harman curve, which is kind of like what Dan Clark Audio does with their high-end headphones, which, I mean, they make $3,000 headphones, but they're well dampened. They're not overly technical from a, a clarity and resolution sake, but it does sound natural. So frequency responses here aren't going to tell the whole picture. You may find that even if it has a similar sound profile to another headset that's more resolving, such as an open back, the open back is going to come across as having more details. So I do address this with my tune specifically to help combat that. But out of the box, um, I think the Maxwell the Nova Pro and the Stealth Pro have more detail out of the box. They seem like they pick up more subtleties in, in layers of sound better. However, we're going to talk about EQ now. So I'm going to switch over to my computer so I can show you the microphone test. We're going to talk on the headset while I show you the software. Go over my EQ settings and the rest of G-Hub for how you can customize it. And I'll come back to you over here. Now I'm going to show you some custom EQ presets on what I think will improve the sound, but I do want to show you this first. So this is my measurement database on SquigLink. There's a few other YouTubers and other audio people out there that do their own uploads for like IEMs and headphones, but I wanted to do one for gamers. And as a result, I've been measuring every gaming headset and headphone and IEM that I have. There's actually a little IEM link here at the top right. But all you have to do is scroll through this list and you can see how any headset that I've measured sounds on a frequency response graph, which helps you understand how to EQ it to your liking, or at least if you're comparing, you know, one headset to another. So I have the Astro A50X highlighted here, and this is what the frequency response is in the default EQ. And you can see what I was talking about. It is an excellent frequency response. It measures really well, and that's why it sounds very natural. That dip in the higher frequencies up here is, it sounds darker than the graph represents. Like this normally would be a pretty resolving detailed headphone, especially if it's an open back. But because of the way this is dampened, you lose some of that detail retrieval up top. Now what's really cool about this site is not only can you compare different headsets by clicking the plus sign, but if you click on the headset drop down below here with this little plus, you could see different measurements I did on the same headset. So the default is default EQ. Now if you put the Gen 4 pad on there, you can then compare how it impacts the sound. You lose a little bit of the bass because the pad's a little bit larger and different film density in my opinion. But overall the frequency response is similar. You do get a little bit of a lift at 6,000 hertz. I'm going to close this one out. The big kicker I want to show you though is if you compare it to the frequency response of the Wicked Cushion Freeze Pad, totally different sound signature. And I'm going to change the color here. That red line is quite a different sound than what you get out of the box with the stock pad. It sounds noticeably heavier in the bass and mid-range region while also having a drastically reduced upper mid-range and treble. So it sounds extremely dark, therefore needs a totally different EQ, which I'll show you in G-Hub. So this is pretty fun to use. And then later, uh, once you've applied my measurements, you can see the byproduct of that. I measured that as well, or once you've applied my EQ. So let's switch over to G-Hub and I'll show you what I can change. 
Now, once you've switched over to G-Hub, you'll see other Logitech products that are plugged into your computer. I have the Lightspeed dongle plugged in just so you can see what it looks like. But we're going to click on the A50X. Now, before you click on the icon, you can click on this settings button on the bottom right. Doing that gives you the options to adjust side tone, your game to chat mix if you don't want to use the buttons, which you can see it changing here. Overall device volume, which is what the volume wheel on the back does. And even see what Bluetooth device you're connected to. Now, the side tone you can disable by attach, switching it to zero. Otherwise, you can crank the side tone and hear yourself speaking, and it's pretty much in real time. Sounds close to how the microphone is recorded, which is really good. It's a good side tone. So I'm gonna click the back arrow, and I wanna show you some more important stuff. So click on the headset. The default EQ is flat, at least on the software. Then you have the gaming preset and the media preset. Very different sound signatures, and it does affect the way the headset sounds. They also give you some presets for the microphone I'll show you but then you can of course create your own. Now, before you get into EQ, there's an important thing you have to toggle. So whenever you make a new preset, you have to check this box advanced in the top right hand corner. Right now you have a 10 band equalizer, which only lets you adjust these 10 bands. So if I wanted to adjust 300 Hertz, I can't do that unless I click the advanced tab. Clicking the advanced tab enables parametric EQ, which means I can pick any frequency I want I can change the width of it to be extremely wide, or I can make it extremely narrow. So check out the difference on how that adjustment, that's how powerful parametric EQ is. The huge thing with this is parametric EQ, whatever your active profile is, saves to the headset instantly, which means you can build your custom profile inside uh, Logitech G-Hub, then it will work on console. So then you can take your headset, plug it into your PlayStation or Xbox and benefit from whatever custom EQ you make. Now you can build these parametric EQ profiles on your phone as well using the Logitech G-Hub app for mobile. However, it doesn't sync with your PC. So if you have 10 presets on your PC, whatever you open on your phone is just gonna show what the currently active preset is. Then you would customize it and override it on the phone, but it's not gonna just show up on your PC later. So keep that in mind, but at least they give you the option to use either platform to customize the sound. Now I have to warn you, these EQ presets I made are definitely not gonna be for everyone. They're fairly aggressive and it could be a little bit jarring. And you can see a very different sound signature here, but give this a shot and I will explain why I changed the way I did. And uh, hopefully it'll make some sense. So normally I would just walk through every single one and read it off, but I'm gonna be doing that three times. This video is already over 40 minutes or close to as it is. So we're just gonna pause it here on the music preset, copy it, and then I'll show you what it measures. All right, so now that you've copied the EQ preset, there's one setting I wanna show you, and that's at 250 Hertz. Now the default Q factor I have set to is three here, but if you subtract three decibels, it thins out the upper part of the bass. It makes it sound a little bit cleaner and it separates the bass into the mid-range mix. So if you find the bass is still a little bit too thick sounding, maybe try this setting and see if it helps. Conversely, if you still find you want more detail in the upper frequencies or less, this is the key one to adjust here. The 4580 Hertz is set to four decibels right now. If you want a little bit more, you could set it up to six and you can see it lifts everything. That's because the Q is set to 0 0.3, which is really wide. If I find that the default setting that you have, if you think it's still too forward, just simply reduce this by a couple dBs and go from there. You can see there's a big change in frequency response adjustment. See if you like this sound and then, you know, kind of fine tune to your liking. Now, once you've done that, if I click on the plus sign for my music preset, you could see the difference here. And again, I'll change the color a little bit. The red line has reduced bass because I'm tilting it more in the upper frequencies. And you could see the higher frequencies here are more filled in. So you can play around with it again, like I said, but this is the impact of doing that EQ. Now I do have an FPS preset. If I click on this, it looks basically the same. Again, you can adjust this part to your liking as far as how strong the uh, frequency adjustment is, but the big difference is in the bass. So instead of leaving everything the way it was at zero before, I boosted 125 Hertz by four decibels with a Q factor of three. I also did minus one dB at 50 Hertz with a Q factor of 0.688 and the other big change is at 20 hertz i did minus six decibels with a q factor of 0.688 this reduced a lot of the sub bass but it still made the bass that's kind of more focused on footsteps 
stronger. So it still sounds somewhat bassy and full, but we're cleaning up the mix that we don't care about as much. Now, for this preset to work correctly, you do want to reduce the 250 hertz range, which I just adjusted a little. So I'm going to type 250 hertz minus 4 dB with a Q of 2.5. That, again, cleans up the upper bass to help combat that spike that I did. And to me, this is a really good EQ preset. Again, I have all the settings on the screen to make it easier for you to clone this. Now let's take a look at how that measures. So I'm going to remove the music preset. I'm going to hit the plus sign, scroll down, and go to my FPS tune. You can see that little build up here at 125 hertz, further reduced bass, and the, again, the higher uh, frequencies, the treble is enhanced. This is going to help focus more on the detail retrieval at the again with the sacrifice of bass. So this is not a preset you want to use for music, but it's great for first-person shooters. The last one I want to show you is the Wicked Cushion Freeze preset, which is drastically different. So we're just going to pause it. If you have the Wicked Cushion Freeze pad, clone this exactly because it makes a huge difference in sound quality. And again, just to show you what that measures like, we're going to switch this over to the Astro A50 Wicked Cushion Freeze Pad. This is how it sounded out of the box. And then once you've applied my tune to the freeze pad, that new line, look at the difference in frequency response. To me, it's much more enjoyable and it kind of preserves, brings back the stock sound a bit, but also improves it as well. Now you could also do some EQ settings on the microphone, which is really cool. I've been talking to you on the default uh, preset this entire time using the A50X mic. If I switch over to the broadcast preset, that's going to boost the bass that you can hear now. It also improves the treble a little bit to help combat some of that bass lift. And the competition preset is going to make me sound more nasally and high pitch. Not a good compliment when I have a cold, uh, but this is what it sounds like in competition. If you go to build your own preset, you can go to new equalizer preset here at the bottom. If you go to build your own preset, all you have to do is click this plus sign to create a new one, which is going to show something like this. New equalizer preset. I'm going to click that now. And this is just a quick one that I made. You don't have to copy this exactly. I was just kind of messing around to show you the difference on how it affects the sound. But typically, you want to boost that 150 hertz area and reduce 1, her one kilohertz and 2 kilohertz to help kind of um, reduce some of that harshness that most microphones have. It's also important to set noise gate. Now, I've been talking to you this whole time with the night noise gate on, which helps combat some of the breathing that you get into the microphone. It also gets rid of computer fan noise. So if I turn that off, you're going to hear some background noise because this is an omnidirectional mic. So let's do that now. Now you can hear more background noise. And if I type, you can hear a lot more of that. Conversely, if I'm on the home preset, which I just switched to, it cuts back. It has a little bit more of a noise gate. You don't hear any background noise. It drastically reduces the breathing sound. And now if I type, you can hear a little bit of stuff coming through, but it's really not strong. Now, tournament is only good if you're basically shouting. If you're talking softer or if you're like me right now and have a, a voice that can barely get through a sentence, um, enabling this, which I just did, is going to sound very choppy. You have to be extremely loud this to sound good but it does block out even more background noise so almost nothing is coming through let's go back to night because to me that's my favorite one it sounds pretty natural but it helps get rid of some of the junk in the background now if you click the routing icon this is where you can adjust the stream port because there is a stream output once gHub is installed this is important to use if you're gaming on this headset but want to stream to OBS you can choose what the mixer of the base station is sending to OBS. Now, if you have your own studio microphone, you would mute your mic output. Otherwise, OBS will pick up the microphone twice. This is where you can also adjust your game volume. So you can adjust this slider here. Bluetooth volume I have muted, but basically if I want to listen to music on my phone, I can choose if that gets relayed to the stream or if I have stream notifications coming in from my phone and I don't want the stream to hear that twice. This is a good way to you know, control what you hear versus what your people hear. And then voice is pretty self-explanatory. That's the voice output of the headset. So if you have uh, game chat enabled and people are talking to you on Discord or in-game, you can control how much of that gets passed through you to stream for the stream to hear your friends speaking. Now, Logitech also has a program called MixLine. It's in beta, and this is like a virtual routing interface. So if you need more capabilities, you don't have to use the G-Hub for that. You can use this instead. And as you can see, I have my Astro A50X game, which is the primary output of the headset. If I add a device, which here I'll do the A50X voice, this is where you would do something like Discord being routed to voice. So I can choose um, and leverage 
the game to chat mix for different sources. This is also a fun way to, you know, dynamically adjust music if you want that to go to the voice stream or the game. Now, what's really cool is if I do, let's watch, I'll show you something kind of fun. So if you look at the stream output, mix line stream is what you would add to OBS. Now, if I do title player to mix line stream and my headset, now I can reduce the game volume or the music volume for what I hear versus what the stream hears. And that same thing applies for everything else. Your Discord stream or chat can also go to the mix line stream and I can reduce the Discord volume or increase it independently from what I hear on my headset. So it's a pretty powerful program. It's actually pretty light on resources. So if you don't want to use things um, that are, I guess, more complicated to use and you like the idea of drag and drop, this is in beta, but it actually works pretty well. I've had some good luck with it. Just wanted to throw out there that this is an option too. All right, so now I want to talk about some uh, real-life user experiences that I've had along the way because when you use the product as much as I had in the past week, you, you find out a few extra things. And one is if you enable side tone, there is side tone hiss, side tone being able to hear yourself speak, which we just discussed, but there is a little bit of a feedback, like a, a s sound that you can't get rid of if side tone is on. It's not overly loud, but it is audible regardless of if your mic is even muted or not. The only way to shut that hiss off is to disable side tone entirely. The other thing that was interesting is they advertise a 24 hour battery life. Now I got nowhere close to that on my first run through, even though it said it was fully charged, I got closer to 10 hours, um, full charge again, you know, which it does charge exceptionally fast. Like this has to be the fastest charging headset I've had, uh, which is great, at least to top off to get back to full again. So on a second run through, I get closer to 15 hours. Now they advertise 24 hours at like, I think it was 76 or 78 decibels. Um, this is plenty loud. However, if you're playing louder uh, games that tend to get 90 to 100 decibels with occasional explosions and things that requires more power and as a result sucks up some of the uh, battery life a little bit. So I don't get the 24 hours. I've had some headsets that go significantly longer or even above their rating. I think 24, is a tad optimistic. The other thing I found out is if you're using this in Bluetooth, um, whether your console is on or not, obviously it has to be paired to the dock, like I said earlier, but you can't max out your Bluetooth volume on your phone or mobile device, it distorts. So there's like a signal to noise issue here where whatever gain they set it to is exceeding the uh, DAC's ability to process that sound cleanly. So I had to keep my phone volume at like 80 to 85% Anything past that introduced uh, noticeable distortion. It sounded pretty bad. Um, the other trick though, is if you're playing a game, let's say you're in a single story and you want your Bluetooth audio to be louder than the game, you control your volume on your phone, for example, and you turn it up. However, if your headset volume is turned down, that's still the max volume. So you're limiting it here. If you turn the volume up, it makes your Bluetooth louder, but it also makes your game louder. You can always crossfade though to the voice chat side, which reduces game volume. So you get a little bit of extra control uh, by doing that trick. I found that when I was playing single player games, I was using that just to have some casual music in the background if I didn't care as much about the game sounds like a racing game, for example. Now, another thing that happened to me last night, which was kind of annoying and it took a while to figure out is the USB connection to my PlayStation 5 when I switched inputs, it just stopped working. I could not use the mic or hear my friends through game chat. And we had dropped a battle royale game before I figured that out. So I had to play the whole game without hearing them speak or them hearing me, which was kind of annoying. The only way I could fix that was to shut down and unplug my PlayStation and this dock and reboot it. Then the USB audio started working again. I don't know if that was a byproduct of the PlayStation bugging out or this dock losing the handshake. But again, I just want to share my personal experience there. And then I mentioned the whole black screen thing. So for how I would be using it, there's two sides. If I'm using it for PC, because of my setup being in two sides of the room, it would just be a USB-C headset only. On the console side, because I have two separate OLEDs, I'd be using uh, USB for Xbox only. So I don't have to deal with the HDMI issues anymore. And that TV can still be connected. Then I would route the HDMI audio from my PlayStation through this so I get better sound quality and game to chat mix on PlayStation. That was the best setup for me and likely how I'd be using it to get the best of both worlds. Now I wanna do a very quick product comparison to some of these and then I'll do an in-depth one down the road because this video is long enough as it is. 
Compared to the Logitech G Pro X2, um, the Astro is better in every single way for the most part. This is a little bit lighter and it's more comfortable to wear as long as you don't mind the leatherette. Um, but the pad opening is larger. And overall, it's a good headset, but it has a darker sound profile. Um, the microphone's not as good. There's no game to chat mix. There's no Xbox support. It just is a, a lesser headset in essentially every single way. And they don't let you use parametric EQ on the G Pro X2, even though it's the same software as the Astro. Um, I think it's because it saves it to the Astro headset and this doesn't have the chip for it. Compared to the older Astro Gen 4s, they still sound really good with a, a nice EQ profile. There's the ability to do custom game presets on the command center. And if you've dialed that in and you're really happy with the sound, do not switch to the G, uh, the, I call it the G because I see the Logitech logo. Don't switch to the A50X just for a massive sound improvement. You're not going to get it. This still has good bass, but it's a little bit darker sounding. Thankfully, we EQ, we can fix it. Where you would upgrade to from this is one, if your battery life is terrible and you don't want to swap the battery or solder, um, or you're having issues or want multi-platform compatibility, this is newer tech. It has Bluetooth, has a much better microphone, but it loses the stream port. This still has the 3.5 millimeter. So there's some steps forward and back compared to the A50 Gen 4. <clears throat> compared to the Stealth Pro, the Stealth Pro is feature packed and it's so easy to use when it works right. It has more bugs lately with some firmware updates with some of the settings kind of resetting sometimes. But the mobile app is excellent. It's very easy to customize and the single little dock that or transmitter that it comes with it, which I have actually. This little guy right here also charges a secondary battery. You have a hot swap battery, simultaneous Bluetooth, single cable plugged into your console of choice. So you do have to plug it in and move it around if you want to switch. But it's great for FPS, really good detail and sound stage. The Odyssey Maxwell, still the sound quality king. There's no denying it's the best sounding gaming headset on the market. It sounds absolutely incredible. Um, for mixed content use, gaming, music, and uh, movies, the Maxwell is my preference. However, the microphone's not as good. It's definitely not as feature rich. There's no simultaneous Bluetooth. And the microphone is better noise rejection, but it also doesn't sound as good. So, um, and it's very heavy. So if you're concerned about long-term comfort from weight, that's the biggest drawback on the Maxwell is the weight. Then you go to the Nova Pro Wireless, which is almost a couple years old now. It's about a year and a half old. It was really ahead of the game back then. It has game to chat mix on Xbox and PC because there's no HDMI, there's no game to chat mix on PlayStation, but it does have 3.5 millimeter input and output. It has an okay mic. It has hot swappable batteries as well. This little battery pack, there's a second one included. And because it has two USB inputs, if you buy the Xbox version, it works on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation all wirelessly. So as far as the sound quality goes, it's not as good as the A50X when you EQ it. And to me, the Turtle Beach and Maxwell have a little bit of an edge, especially after EQ on the Stealth. Out of the box, this isn't bad. It's still very clear sounding. It's just a different sound profile that some people may or may not like. But they're all compelling. <laughs> it's just pros and cons of what you're willing to sacrifice or the design. I do love the comfort of the Nova Pro Wireless once you've swapped the pads. And funny enough, um, they used to have a huge ANC bump where the microphone was and it would press against your ear and some people had comfort issues. They had a silent revision recently where they flattened that baffle out so it's no longer a pain point. So you may not even need to upgrade the pads anyway. Uh, but that covers the roundup of competitors and I'll do a, a deeper dive down the road. All right, so we made it to the end. I knew this was gonna be a long video. I'm thankful that my voice made it. Um, this is a very expensive headset and at 380, it's certainly not worth it to a lot of people, especially if you don't need some of the features that this has. There are some unique benefits to it because it's very comfortable and arguably has the best wireless microphone I've ever heard on a gaming headset. It's also the best one for PlayStation that has game to chat mix built into the headset, which is an incredibly useful feature, frankly, that I wish more headsets could support had Sony allowed it. So whether it's worth it to you or not is your opinion. I'm not going to go down the path of saying it is or it isn't. Frankly, to me, I think it's a little bit overpriced for what you're getting when you factor in how it sounds out of the box and the fact that I've had some issues with HDMI on Xbox. I wish some of that worked a little bit better. Um, but I do want to commend Logitech and Astro for doing something different 
in taking approach that no one's really done because at least it's addressing something um, that some people may have been looking for and haven't been able to find until now. So hopefully you found this very long and in-depth review helpful. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. I'd love to see you in a future video and stay safe out there and I'll see you next time.